Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to another midweek Bible study. If you're checking us out for the first time, welcome. My name is Samuel, and I'm the lead pastor here at CFWA, Christ Family Worship Assembly. Now, for the last few months, we've been in a Bible study series going through the book of Psalms. And last week, we started book five, and one of our great teachers, Patricia Copeland Johnson, taught us on Psalm 107. It was a great teaching. I'm encouraging you, if you didn't watch it, if you didn't check it out, watch the last video of last week because she gave a great introduction into book five, which is the last book of the Psalms. Now, I'm really excited about book five because there's just a lot of great Psalms in this book. But tonight, I'm gonna to be focusing on Psalm 110. Now, this is a very significant Psalm not only in the book of Psalms, but in the entire Bible. As we go through it, you will see why. Now, I'm going to read the Psalm in its entirety, and then we're going to come back and go verse by verse to see what God has for us in this Psalm. I'm excited, so grab your Bibles, get your notes, uh, settle on in, and let's do this. So, the, the heading of this Psalm says, Of David, a Psalm. Now, what we mentioned a few weeks back is that whenever we see of David in a psalm, in the heading, it either means it was written by David or it was written about David by someone else. And usually the context of the psalm lets us know which one of those is at play. Now, based on this context, David is the one who actually wrote this psalm. So it's by David. And we're going to see why we're making that claim as we go through. Now, beginning at verse 1. It says, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troops will be willing on your day of battle, arrayed in holy splendor. Your young men will come to you like dew from the morning's womb. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge the nations, heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. He will drink from a brook along the way, and so he will lift his head high. Now, there is a lot in this psalm, and I'm, I'm pretty sure we won't get into everything in this psalm, but I believe that we're going to get into enough that will make us see why this psalm is so important in the story of the Bible. Now, this psalm, Psalm 110, is the most alluded to and quoted psalm in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, if you study, you'll probably find that this psalm and verses in this psalm are the most quoted Old Testament scriptures in the New Testament. Now that's, that's saying something. That's letting us know that this psalm is significant in how the New Testament followers understood who Jesus was. Now, when we talk about the New Testament, I want to give a working definition. The New Testament is the story of God fulfilling the promises he made to his people through Jesus Christ of Nazareth, his son. That's a working definition of the New Testament for our time tonight. Now, the first verse in this psalm, verse 1, is cited so many times in the New Testament. It's important that we just pay attention to what's being said here. Now, the psalm starts out, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now, to be honest with you, we can spend the rest of tonight and maybe even the next two studies on this verse alone, because that's how much is really packed into this verse. Now, this, this first verse, verse 1, gave context and a reference point for how the disciples, the, the early followers of Jesus, and those who heard their message, 
who heard their message about Jesus, how they were to understand who Jesus was. This is the verse that they referenced the most to give people an idea of who Jesus Christ of Nazareth really was. For example, in Matthew chapter 22, beginning at verse 41, look at what's happening here. It says, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, what do you think about the Messiah or the Christ? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. And he said to them, how is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, highlight that phrase, underline that phrase, calls him Lord? For he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? So in this dialogue with the Pharisees, Jesus quotes Psalm 1. And he has the entire psalm in mind, but he directly quotes Psalm 1. Now what I want to draw your attention to is in verse 43, where it says that David speaking by the Spirit. Now, Jesus says that when David wrote those words, he was speaking by the Spirit. He wrote it by the Spirit. He spoke it by the Spirit. In other words, David was inspired by the Spirit. He was moved by the Spirit. He was motivated by the Spirit. He was directed by the Spirit to write that psalm. Now, the word that we would use to kind of define that dynamic is the word prophetic. Now, if you've been in church for a while, you've probably heard that term before. Maybe you haven't been in church for a while, and that's a new term for you. But let me also give a working definition when it comes to prophetic. And I think the best way, way to define it is to look at Scripture itself. Now, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21 gives, I believe, the most clearest definition of what prophetic or prophecy is. And this is what it says. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. I love that phrase. They were carried along by the Holy Spirit. In other words, prophets, those who spoke on behalf of God and who spoke God's words, the content of those words are considered to be prophecy. And what Peter says here is that what prophets say don't come from their own imagination. They don't just wake up one day and say, I'm going to come up with a prophecy. No, what they say is carried by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what makes those words come alive. Let me just say this. I don't care who the preacher is. I don't care who the pastor is. I don't care who the teacher is. Unless our words are set on fire by the Holy Spirit, they will amount to nothing. Spiritual words. Words that point people to God, words that communicate things about God, they have to be set on fire by the Holy Spirit. They have to be carried by the Holy Spirit. And what Jesus says in Matthew 22 is that David's words were carried <laughs> by the Spirit. And because of that, he wrote that first verse, David did, back to Psalm 110. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now, here's another reference. The first sermon that Peter preaches in the book of Acts, when he's talking about who Jesus was, this is what he says in Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 33. He says, exalted to the right hand of God, catch the language here, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven 
And yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. So Peter is saying that according to David, this is what God says about Jesus. God says about Jesus, sit at my right hand while I make all your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now that's another reference, and there's many more references in the New Testament to this first verse alone. So that's saying something about the importance of this verse and our understanding of Jesus Christ. Now remember, the, the first words of this psalm says, the Lord said, or the Lord says. So this psalm starts out with pointing to God's own words. Now, the Lord said, or the Lord says, this is what Old Testament prophets would say right before they would share whatever they're going to share. And this is the only time that phrase is found in the psalm. That's telling us something. It's telling us once again that Psalm 110 is prophetic in nature. Now, all of the psalms, in fact, all of the Bible, all of the words of God are inspired by God. Let me just say that because the Bible says, talking about itself, that all scripture is God-breathed. It is inspired by God. It originates from God. It is carried by God. It is ignited by God. But what I'm saying that in Psalm, Psalm 110, it is directly letting us know that this is prophecy. Now remember, there are Psalms of lament, there are Psalms of thanksgiving, there are Psalms of praise, and what this psalm lets us know is that there are also pro prophetic psalms. Sorry, prophetic psalms. And this is one of those psalms. So this is God's word, God's oracle. God's oracle. Now, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now, what you'll find in the Bible story is that being at the right hand of someone speaks to a position of power and a position of authority. And making enemies a footstool, now in these times, it was a sign of strength for a king or for a ruler to put his foot, his, his foot on the neck of either another king who he has conquered or maybe an enemy to show that he was the one in charge. It was symbolic of his authority. And based on this first verse, God says to his king, Jesus, sit at the position of the highest authority and all of your enemies will be made your footstool. In other words, I'm putting you in charge. Now this points us back to Psalm 2, if you remember that Psalm. Maybe on, in your own time, go back to Psalm 2 and compare it with this Psalm because I think you'll see some parallels. Now verse 2, it says, The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion, saying, Rule in the midst of of your enemies. Now the scepter was also a symbol of, of power and authority and in many ways it was an extension of the person who rules. In other words, whoever had the scepter was the one in charge. Now you'll probably see this in movies that have their backdrop in like old times, um, you know, uh, early times in the Mediterranean, whether it's in Egypt or whether it's in Greece or whether it's in Rome, um, more so uh, Greece than Rome. But for the most part, you'll see in some of these old movies that the ruler or the emperor or the king usually had a scepter or a staff or something. And, and, and that was meant to symbolize that he was in charge, that he was the one who had all authority. So in verse 2, what what, what David is saying is that the, the scepter is given to this king, who we know to be Jesus, and in other words, his, his, his rule will be extended. Because he has the scepter, he's the one in charge. And, and his rule will be extended. So, I, my, 
my iPad just crashed on me, but it just came back up. Thank you, Jesus. So in other words, the, the authority of the Lord extends everywhere. So he says, rule in, in the midst of your enemies. Now that word rule has this idea of being undisputed, without question, whether you like it or not. Undisputed. I love that term. Now, verse 3. It says, your troops will be willing on your day of battle, arrayed in holy splendor. Your young men will come to you like dew from the morning's womb. So the idea in this verse is that people will offer themselves willingly to the king's campaign. In other words, the king doesn't have to force people to be on his side. He, he doesn't have to conduct some kind of draft and bring people into his military against their own will. What he says is that people offer themselves willingly. And it's as if David is saying, young men will be the first ones to sign up. Now, when, when we think about young men, we usually think about those that are often rebellious. They think they know it all. They want to go on their own. They think they can conquer the world. There's nothing wrong with that. That's just how it is to be a young person, to be a young man. I was like that. I'm sure if you're an older man, you can look back on your youth and say, man, nobody couldn't tell me nothing, man. Like, and and, and that's, that's important because based on this verse, it's almost as if there's something about God's king that makes young men say, sign me up. I'm, I'm, I'm all in. They're full of energy, full of zeal, full of passion. Now, if you can get young men to commit to anything, that's, that's something powerful. And let me just say this too. As, as a church, our prayer is to see young men rise up and take their rightful place as, as kings, as princes. We want to see young men rise up and to be everything God has called them to be in Jesus' name. And we are committed to that as a church. I just want to say that. We are committed to seeing our young men become not just productive citizens in society, not just great family men, but great men of God, men who love God, men who worship God, men who love God's word, men who love God's people. We want to see young men rise up in our midst in that way, in Jesus' name. Verse 4, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now, this is another verse in this psalm that we could spend two weeks on because there's so much in this verse, but we're going to touch on just a few dynamics. Now, two things stand out here in this verse. Number one, God calls his king a priest. Now that's important because in the Old Testament story, kingship and priesthood were meant to be separate. Now they worked together, but they were really meant to operate independently. What I mean by that is kings were not supposed to be priests and priests were not supposed to be kings. That's just how things were laid out. Now, there might've been some moments where we have some overlap and especially in the life of David, we see David in many ways operating um, as a priest, even though he was a king, but that wasn't the norm. That was the exception to the rule. That's why it's, it, it really stands out to see God calling his king a priest. That's number one. And number two, this king is a priest forever. The two things that stand out. Now, this would have caught people off guard like, whoa, wow. Now, and he uses Melchizedek as a point of reference. And Melchizedek is a guy that, that shows up once in the Old Testament story in Genesis 14, and we don't hear anything from him again. Everything else we hear about him is more commentary. It's more reference. This is the only time he comes up in Genesis chapter 14. Now, in this chapter... Abraham had just rescued his nephew Lot, who was caught in the crossfire of a war between rival kings. Lot got caught up, so Abraham got his peeps together 
And he went and he rescued Lot. And he brought Lot back. And on his way back, Abram meets Melchizedek, the king of Salem, who was also a priest of God. And this is what happens. Genesis 14, verse 19 and 20. And he, Melchizedek, blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Now, after this story, the next mention of Melchizedek is in this psalm, Psalm 110. And that's it in the Old Testament. And then after that, the next time we hear about Melchizedek is in the New Testament book of Hebrews, chapter 5 and chapter 7 specifically. Now, in those chapters in the book of Hebrews, we find a little more explanation about the significance of the relationship between Melchizedek and Jesus. For example, I'm going to read a few of these verses, and I'm going to let the Bible speak for itself here when it comes to this. So Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, it says, Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. So that gives us a working definition of what a priest does. He represents the people to God, and he offers gifts and sacrifices for sins. Verse 2, he is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on himself. But he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. In other words, nobody just wake up and says, hey, I'm a priest. It doesn't work like that, especially in the, especially in the Bible. It doesn't work like that. You have to be called to be a priest, just as Aaron was. Verse 5, in the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, you are my son, today I have become your father. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So that last verse in verse 6, he references Psalm 110. Now, in Hebrews chapter 7, the first four verses, it says this, this Melchizedek was king of the city of Salem, and also a priest of God most high. When Abraham was returning home after winning a great battle against the kings, Melchizedek met him and blessed him. Then Abraham took a tenth of all he had captured in battle and gave it to Melchizedek. The name Melchizedek means king of justice and king of Salem means king of peace. There is no record of his father or mother or any of his ancestors, no beginning or end to his life. He remains a priest forever, resembling the Son of God. Consider then how great this Melchizedek was. Even Abraham, the great patriarch of Israel, recognized this by giving him a tenth of what he had taken in battle. Verse 8, the priests who collect tithes are men who die. So Melchizedek is greater than they are because we are told that he lives on. Down to verse 16 of the same chapter in Hebrews. Jesus became a priest, not by meeting the physical requirement of belonging to the tribe of Levi, but by the power of a life that cannot be destroyed. And the psalmist pointed this out when he prophesied, there's that word, you are a priest forever, in the order of Melchizedek. I'm hoping that you're seeing how all of this is kind of working together, how scripture is, is, is teaching us something about Jesus that's important here. Down to verse 20. This new system was established with a solemn oath. Aaron's descendants became priests without such an oath. But there was an oath regarding Jesus, for God said to him, the Lord has taken an oath and will not break his vow. 
you are a priest forever. That's quoting again Psalm 110, verse 22. Because of this oath, Jesus is the one who guarantees this better covenant with God. There were many priests under the old system, but death prevented them from remaining in office. But because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. Therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. We can just say amen in this Bible study. And, and that, that's powerful. I love that last verse. Because Jesus lives forever, he's able to save those who come to God through him. And he lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. In other words, one of the things that Jesus is doing now is interceding on behalf of those who are God's people. To those who trust him, follow him, believe in him. He is interceding. He is praying for us. Think about that. Jesus is praying for us. That's a powerful thought. Now, there's, there's so much more that can be said, but I'm hoping you're getting the point about Melchizedek, Jesus being a priest forever, and what that means. Now, back to Psalm 110, verse 5. It says, The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. Now, this is a scene of like battle where God is in the position of support. Now remember, God said to his king, Jesus, sit at my right hand. Now this verse says that the Lord is at your right hand. In other words, God is at the right hand of the king in terms of being his support, being his strength, being his refuge, being his enabler, being his, his source of strength. In other words, this king knows that he can always rely and count on God, his father. And the same thing applies to us. Because we are in Christ, because we are united with Jesus, we have the same assurance that God can be relied on. He can be counted on. He won't let us down. Amen to that. Verse 6, it says, He will judge the nations, heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. In other words, this king is an authority in every way, and all those who oppose him will lose. Period. <laughs> that, that pretty much sums up verse 6. All those who oppose him will lose. It doesn't matter how rich you are. It doesn't matter how many uh, uh, people in in your country, how big your army is. It doesn't matter if you have nuclear weapons. It, it, everyone who goes against the kingdom of God that is ruled by Jesus will lose, period. As a matter of fact, the book of Revelation spells out what that looks like. Listen, I believe that you can describe the book of Revelation in two words. Jesus wins. You can go into all other methods of interpretation, whether you're a millennialist, an amillennialist, whether you're a preterist, whether you think it's talking about the future or the past, whether it was written in AD 70 or AD 90, doesn't matter. The point of the book of Revelation is this, Jesus wins, period. <laughs> Verse seven, it says, he will drink from a book along the way, and so he will lift his head high. Now, this gives us a picture of what happens after the battle. It's as if the king is like taking a moment to refresh himself, to pause. And then he lifts up his head high. And in other words, he knows that he has won. And here's the deal. As followers of Jesus, we don't have to wait until the battle is over. <laughs> we can shout now. We can praise now because we know God's king wins. Jesus wins. And if he wins, all those who follow him, trust him, believe in him, serve him, love him, also win. 
not only in this life, but in the one to come. In Jesus' name, I declare that to be so. Because he is already victorious, because he sits right now at the right hand of God, he is already ruling and reigning. And that gives us hope. That gives us assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory. Divine. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the reality of your king. The king that you have chosen. The king who sits at your right hand. The king who all his enemies are being made his footstool. We thank you, Lord, for this king who lives forever. He intercedes on our behalf. He is undisputed. He is undefeated. He is King of kings, and He is Lord of lords. Jesus Christ, we celebrate the victory that is already won, and we look forward to the time where that victory is realized in every sense and in every way. We thank you, Lord, for this study. I'm asking God that, that the words that I chose to use tonight, that you would carry them along to where they're supposed to go. Open our eyes, Lord. As we study this psalm, even on our own time, apart from the study, show us something new. Show us something that would make us come alive. Show us the beauty of your Son and what that means for us today. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now, I hope this psalm was a blessing to you. Go ahead and read it on your own time. I'm sure you're, that you're going to find a lot of stuff that will minister to you and, and, and hopefully benefit you as you continue to grow in faith. Now, God bless you all, Christ family. Remember, we're going to meet Sunday at 10 a.m. over at Gaines Park in Green Hall. So we'll live stream our service at 10 a.m., but we want the entire family to come on out and to be with us for this in-person service. It's going to be a great time. Looking forward to seeing you guys there. Have a good night. Enjoy the rest of your week.